and tell, sis and tell A whole lot of talk, a whole lot of nothing Amanda does stand up, Allison's on TV And when they hop on the phone, you already know It's the place you wanna be Sis and tell, sis and tell The podcast is so sweet Oh, sis and tell Sis and tell, a whole lot of talk about A whole lot of nothing Sis and tell Hey, Allie. Hey, man. How are you? I've got terrible news. You always start with that, <laughs> and it's never terrible. I do not. I mean, I do start with, like, hyperbole, right? But this is pretty bad. What? They're, they're supposed to be a tequila shortage. What do you mean? <laughs> you didn't... What do you mean there is supposed to be a tequila shortage? There's, there's going to be a tequila shortage. Who there's says that? Be... George Clooney? He's just trying to sell his tequila brand. Don't believe him. No, mommy. First of all, mommy sent us an article about it. Didn't you see that? Oh, I uh, sort of saw it. What did it say? I didn't read it. Obviously, it's it's everything. It's from Men's Journal, which oh. is a reputable source. There's a tequila shortage coming. Here's what to know. First, it was the eggs. Now it's the tequila. Stop. I'm that. sure it's. I'm sure it's like. Don't make me read the article. Okay, I'm a headline no. person. I'm giving you. <laughs> All you need to know. That's all you need to know. Go go overstock on on your tequila, and you'll be good. So here's here's my ignorance. Um, what is tequila made from? It is made from uh, like agave. just like a, an agave it's made from plant, agave. right? Yeah. And so there's is an that agave the problem? Shortage. Yes. Uh, well, so that was my question. Like, is there what what is being shorted that? Or, or is in low supply that they can't make it. So the agave plant. So there's a shortage is hitting Mexico and tequila uh, demand has increased worldwide. And yeah. then the price of agave has gone up sixfold in the past two years. I'm so, and I've then they have a bottle of tequila sitting <laughs> as like the centerpiece. Some people have flowers. Have Some tequila. people have um, beautiful bowls of fruit. I have a beautiful tequila bottle sitting in the middle of my kitchen, and it makes me really happy. I don't drink it every night. I just like to look at it to know it's there. And now I'm going to go buy more with and this you shortage. Can't, and you can't, you, I mean, look, they grow the agave, but they don't want to use, they like to use like aged agave. So it's not right. like as soon as it's ready, they're like, okay, time for more tequila. Like there's like a whole process as there always is with a lot of alcohol, right? There's always like some sort of aging process. So anyway. Stock up, or everyone send me a bottle of your tequila if you're not using it. I'll take you your have to Tell me twice. Yeah, well, I've got a plenty, a plentiful supply of whiskey, so now I'll have to work on my tequila supply. Yeah. So I went on a trip. Uh, we had uh, February break, winter break last week, and I went to North Carolina with Oscar and Ruby and mommy and daddy. And I'm loading up the car. Aaron took Murray camping, which we don't do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We, meaning you Dad. and the other children. Yeah, it goes against my ethics. And um, so, but as I'm loading up the car, Ruby's with me, and I put a bottle of tequila in there, and she goes, Mommy, I get it. You're going on vacation with your parents and your kids. <laughs> you need, you're, you're bridging two generations. Yeah. That's right. I was in charge in ways I didn't realize I needed to be. <laughs> So, you know, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to tell this story, but I feel like it needs to be told on the podcast, especially in light of where we are, like, in the world, um, in terms of intolerance and specifically anti-Semitism. But, you know, the only time I've ever been to that part of North Carolina, we went to Highlands and Cashiers, mm -hmm. um, was when Alan and I were first married. Um, and it was really cute. His mom of blessed memory packed us a little picnic lunch and uh, we went and it's like a three hour drive from here. And of course, that's when Alan also learned that I am very car sick when we go around curves. Oh, and my mountains. God. I we had literally, to drive. <laughs> yeah, we had to pull over in the middle of some mountain so that I could drive or else I was going to puke up whatever tuna fish said. It is bad. His mom it had is packed. bad. It is. It is so not only is it so curvy, it is dangerous. There's like you're not just on these mountain roads with other cars they're like tractor trailers yes these Go trucks with, are yeah. crazy yeah it's it's not fun and it's so. like in a thousand foot drop right on, the, on you know 
<laughs> so I'm afraid for my life. I'm car sick. I'm <laughs> but then we got there and then we were staying at this, like he booked some place as it was a surprise. And it sort of had, you know, that like wall to wall shag carpeting, a little bit feel of like Gracelandish, but that yeah. was also fun. The bathroom the whole has thing was wallpaper fun. that right. has texture to it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and then also you can put a coin into the bed and it does a little shaking, you know, whatever those, those I are, would that's totally really try 1970s. That. If I had change, if I, <laughs> if had, I change. had change, <laughs> who has change anymore? Right. But what happened, the story that, that I'm sharing that I think is important because I'm not sure this is from just two decades ago, but we were shopping around one of the cute little areas in in Highlands, I think. And we're in this little shop that had sort of like mountain gear and, um, I don't know, hats and scarves and gloves, et cetera. And um, I'm trying on some hiking boots. And I hear, um, you know, this woman, an older man talking. He's like, well, I really like this hat. And I found it in the sale bin. And the woman who was helping me said, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Somebody must have put that hat in the sale bin. It's actually not on sale. Um, but it was just misplaced there. He's like, well, it was in the $5 bin. You know, he's still, you know, kind of pushing back. And she goes, I understand. I know this happens all the time. People put back merchandise in the wrong place, but it's not on sale. He goes, well, I think you should give it to me on sale. And so finally his wife says, look in a very robust voice, like across the store to the saleswoman, oh, ignore my husband. He's just trying to Jew him down. And literally, it was like one of those scenes in a movie where I felt like, um, you know, the camera is like, like close up on me and it's and it's getting a little fuzzy and I'm not believing my hear my ears. And so part of me was Alan with you. So Alan is in one part of the store. It's not a huge store. Right. But he's there for sure and could hear it. And, and he so, knows you. yeah. And he knows me. And of course, I hear this and go, what? And Alan hears it. And he's thinking, oh, gosh, because he knows what's happening next. Because part of me is what happens with all of us, which is to just ignore it. Like, she's obviously ignorant or a bigot or anti semitic whatever she is. It's or not my she's problem. unaware. Sometimes people are just unaware that that's an offensive phrase. They don't Correct. know what it means. They don't know where it comes from. They don't know how offensive it is. And sometimes all it takes is pulling someone aside in a non-aggressive way and then saying, hey. That's exactly what I thought. Then my next thought is, well, you know what? This is a learning opportunity. I don't have to get upset, obviously, because we've met people like that before growing up in Alabama who use that phrase, Jew them, and think it's a word. They don't realize it is the word Jew right. run down, which, yeah. which insinuates that Jews are of course, you know, very um, stingy or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it's a it's a negative stereotype about Jewish people that is just uncalled for. So I take on the approach of here I am. How, how, how opportune for me to be able to educate this woman. So I perk up and I say, excuse me, what did you just say? And she goes, excuse me. I said, I was just curious what you just said. She goes, I don't know. What did I just say? And she's already on the defensive. And I'm not attacking. I'm just yeah. really trying to get to the bottom. I said, I think you just said the words Jew them down. And she goes, yes. I said, well, I just want you to know that um, that's a very offensive phrase towards Jewish people. And I fully in my, you know, sort of Mary Poppins-ish, you know, <laughs> la-di-da, naive way thought immediately she would say, oh my goodness, I am so sorry. We'd have some reconciliation and kumbaya moment. We'd be sipping coffee at a shop nearby and discussing life and, and how we make mistakes. But no, she's like... <laughs> <laughs> we'd be recording a podcast together right, right. in yeah. fact right we'd be recording a podcast together for the rest of our lives that is indeed not what happened and meanwhile these you know these people are probably you know if I'm in my early or either early 30s really late 20s at this point they're probably in their late 50s right they're probably my age at this point um and I said that's a very offensive phrase to choose and she goes okay well sorry that I wasn't being pc and then I'm really upset. I said, well, actually, it's not a matter of being PC. It's just a matter of being kind. And I'm Jewish and I take a personal offense to that. And it's not a phrase that I appreciate or I think you should ever use. And she's like, oh, well, sorry you feel that way. And then her husband is like, what, honey? And she's like, we're out of here. 
come on, honey, let's go. And she just, I think, I think she you know, did looking back is she yeah. knew she was embarrassed. Yeah. Instead of owning it and taking responsibility and apologizing, she made a huff, grabbed her husband and left. Alan is sort of like deer in the headlights across the store. What was the sales associate doing? The saleswoman is also caught totally off guard because like she's right next to me helping me try on these boots. She's trying to literally navigate the scene. And she's like, um, I was like, yeah, I don't think these boots are going to work, but I'll try a different size. She's like, okay. <laughs> and then I was sort of shaking because I realized that, you know, like the confrontation, I really didn't have time to think about what I was going to say. If I was going to say, I just said it. Yeah. And I say this in the context of today, right? Like, um, we've done a lot of anti-Semitism work in Chattanooga specifically, but I know also in Atlanta and, um, this is their rising campaigns all over the country to to really broach the subject to create these conversations and to remind people that number one if you hear something or you see something you need to say something and do something and secondly as we know you know anti-semitism doesn't live in isolation so if somebody is anti-semitic chances are they're also racist and homophobic and xenophobic and you know that all of the isms come with it and that you need to stand up for all people who are marginalized or or there's or creating an otherhood society because one day the chances are you'll be part of that otherhood. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just think we have this discussion a lot with the teenagers that I work with, but also with adults in our community. And I just want to acknowledge number one, it's scary. Number two, sometimes it's hard and uncomfortable, but it's also necessary. And so I think back to that situation. I've never been back to Highlands. Hopefully you had a better experience yes. <laughs> you, uh, without the overt anti-Semitism it was or ignorance. L- much less anti-Semitic. That <laughs> my experience had no anti-Semitism involved. Uh, but you know, mom, look, I think you have to, in your head, sometimes have a conversation about how you would have that conversation because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? And it's not right. just interrupting anti-Semitic comments it's interrupting prejudice and you have to I think people have to do it in a certain way to be effective right and mommy had a similar situation where she was in a meeting and someone used that phrase and she waited until after the meeting to have a conversation with them and the person was of course embarrassed I think probably grateful that mommy didn't call them out in front of the meeting and then she said that is a phrase I grew up with my dad always used it I had no idea thank you for telling me, right? That was, and then that was a totally different experience and you never know what you're going to get. And here's the thing, that woman, she may continue to use that phrase and not care what you said, or maybe she got so embarrassed and now knows and has never used that phrase since. Right. So sometimes you don't know your impact because you, you don't engage with that person. Right. After that and look, incident. and I, to say that I'm innocent, it would be, you know, a gross uh, mischaracterization of the situation as well, because I've used phrases. I know we both have I, a lot of everyone has used phrases where, number one, either they were, you know, wrong to use. But more than likely is there was a history behind that phrase that we were unaware of. And then right. once you become aware, once you know better, you do better. Right. right. According yes. to. Maya Angelou and others, but you have to, you know, like there's no excuse for not, the not knowing is, is forgivable. But once you know, you have to change your ways. You have to do better. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, I just, I, yeah, to your point, I just hope maybe that woman did change her ways and I didn't, my goal was not to embarrass her. It was to call her out. Mm -hmm. I thought I really did think she was going to react more to how, to mommy's situation years ago, um, which was a more of, I didn't know. Thank you for telling me. Right. Um, and it's hard. It's hard as adults. It's hard as kids. It's hard at any age to acknowledge our faults, to take responsibility and to move on. But um, I'm going to, my goal is I want to get better at that myself, right? To acknowledge when I've done something wrong and be able to, to change and move forward. Yeah. Well, you know, we had different incidents that happened. (laughs) Different traumas. (laughs) Different traumas that happened when we were there. Um, And speaking of going up those windy roads, we were all piled into Mommy and Daddy's minivan. And Mommy was gracious enough to let me sit in the passenger seat because I get super duper nauseous. I wish I'd been driving because there ended up being this huge chunk of the road that was missing. There was a pot, basically a pothole on the side of the road. And dad drove right through it 
the tire popped like immediately popped. immediately it popped and That's we had you could hear and so i i put on the hazards for dad and as soon as we find and i'm putting this in quotes a driveway he pulled into it it was like this gravel driveway that and we pulled off to the side i was like you need to pull off more he tried calling triple a and ruby's like mom we need to look pathetic <laughs> dad's like daddy's like there's no spare tire i go there's a spare tire we have a spare tire you just don't know where it is and i go on youtube and i look up toyota sienna i figure out where everything is and how to access it we're probably pulled over for like 15 or 20 minutes dad's trying to communicate with triple a where he is which is like a comedy of errors it was like the woman he talked to was so southern I couldn't understand her. And <laughs> and then she would try and spell things out for dad. And he we were like, what what letter is she saying? Like we What is she not... trying to spell? Why would she spell out for dad? Because she was trying to repeat back where um like, Oh, like his location. Like like where his lo- our location was and where these places were that could fix the tire. And it was almost five o'clock, so all these places were closing. Right. And I couldn't get an Uber. I was going to stick mom in an Uber with Oscar and Ruby and then stay with dad. Um, and then. It's like I you're get, in a foreign country. <laughs> oh, my God. And then. And I said to, um, you know, dad's got. Um, what is the word? He's really like loquacious, you know. Talkative. It's, yeah he's just very yeah. detailed when it comes like detailed in a way he doesn't need to be so right. she's like what happened and instead of saying i hit a pothole in my car he's like, well my my daughter's coming here for her break right exactly <laughs> goes into the hole all the details and he describes everything except for saying pothole so i'm yelling i'm like it's a pothole we hit a pothole and then she's like are you in a safe place and he's like well and i'm like no i'm like dad give me the phone i'm like i am with two people they're almost 80 and the kids we're on the <laughs> side of a mountain there's an a thousand foot drop i was like trying to make it right. sound there's like, an urgency right and and i'm like there are 18 wheelers zooming past us i'm like you need to send someone what really we needed was the ch- the tire to be changed we needed right. the spare we were three miles away from the house we were staying at so finally this guy pulls over in a truck bless his heart this guy josh he is he changes the tire he's like where he he's like it's supposed to be here in the honda i go yeah but this is a toyota it's right here and he goes oh and he goes oh well i don't see it i go no you gotta go there he goes oh how do you know all this i go i watched a youtube video <laughs> then, then he goes well we have to release it somehow i go yeah the tools are in the back here you go and he goes oh is it this one i go no it's that one he's like just from this youtube video I go yep and then he's trying to teach Oscar how to change a tire in the middle of all of this. Oh my and, gosh. And Ruby's Wait, did like, you have a jack? You had a jack also? It comes with the car. Yeah, the car comes with a kit. Okay. Like, you don't know. Go YouTube it. Everyone should right. know how to change a spare tire. Yes. This is the end, end all be all. Know where your spare tire is. Know where all the tools are. Learn how to change it safely. Because if you jack up the car the right wrong way, you're screwed. Like, we were on a hill and he's like, we need to put rocks in front of the tires. We need to do this. And you know and he's giving me a lot of anxiety oh my god so this on top of like being with my children and my parents you know (laughs) on the edge of a mountain and and so so josh is trying to teach uh, oscar how to change the tire and ruby's like hey i'd like to know how to change the tire she's like i I can do this too So I'm like, hey, Josh, I appreciate you trying to teach Oscar, but we're on the side of a road and there's like 18 wheelers zooming past us. I don't want my kid. Wait, (laughs) how old do you think Josh is? I think he was like in his early 30s. That is so nice. He was such a nice guy. And of course, mommy wanted to, mom and dad are like getting out cash. And I go, and they're like, what can we do for you? And I go, he is not going to accept your money. He's right. not going to accept it. Don't make him uncomfortable. They're like, we, what if we just shove it in his hand? I go, no. He was like asking for, he was like, just send a prayer up, right? He's just like, just, I'm happy to help. Just send a prayer up. This is what I do. And I'm, and I'm like, um, mommy, it was not going to stop. I go, Josh, can you just, can I just text you and you send me? Cause they're like, can you give us a business card? We just want to say thank you. I go, just, just text me at your address and they just want to send a thank you note right just please <laughs> right. please so, give me this so i text him he texts me back and um i, I said look 
uh, my idea was, I said, Josh, we would love to donate to an organization <laughs> that's important to you. It, uh, on your in your honor, Josh. I, we'd like to send you one of my mom's banana breads. Right, I knew that was coming. And you're mommy. invited to Thanksgiving next so year. I'm in the uh, middle. I'm in the middle of texting. And guess what? You know, mommy. Her mo. She ends up finding out everything about someone within five minutes. And she goes, "Well, okay. Josh said that he went to Auburn, and I've looked up the alumni page, and I cannot find him anywhere." I'm like, "Please stop." And Ruby's like. Nene, are you stalking the guy who changed our tire? I'm like, yeah, she is. She goes, well, I'm going to message them and ask them. We knew his like first name and his last name and what he did for a living. So she's like, well, I just looked at, he said he w- worked for a construction company and I found this construction company in North Carolina with his last name. Do we think that's his? I'm like, please stop. I have his number. I have his address. You don't need to do any of this. She goes, but what? He's not going to let us do anything. I go, mommy, please stop stalking Josh. <laughs> right. Literally, Josh. This is why Josh learns now at an early age, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> right. This is where the phrase came from, Josh. So we're so sorry you stopped to do a good sorry. deed. And now you are forever indebted to us, indebted to our gratitude, which is Until a lot. You're yeah. going to get a lifetime supply of chocolate chip banana breads. <laughs> Poor Josh. Yeah. Oh, man. It was so funny, uh, but we're safe. Dad found a place to change the tire the next day. Yeah. I took the kids snow tubing. Everything was good. It all worked out. Yeah. By the way, I get th- I must get that from mommy because um, I had a f- I had ran out of gas years ago. I mean, I think Arthur was in preschool and I had to call a grandmother to go pick him up. And I was like a mile from the gas station and somebody stopped to like help me fill up and all the stuff. And I did the same. This is before phones. And um, I said, oh. um, I said, could I could you write down your address for me? And the guy looked at me like I was a stark raving lunatic. He goes, why do you need my address? I go, well, I'd like to send you a thank you note, right? Like, it's so Southern. And he thought, like, that was it. Like, he's like, no, I don't want to give you my address. I'm like, okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> like, Oh, it was, my God. Then it's, like, a, uncomfortable. I, I know. Well, as a Southerner, though, that's our instinct. Like, we yeah. want to, like, like, thank you so much for doing this. And we feel like this handwritten note seals yeah. the deal. Well, I so. said to him, if you're comfortable Will you send us an address so my mom can send you a note? <laughs> so my mom can legitimately stalk you. I'm so sorry if you hear from the president of the North Carolina Auburn University alumni wondering if right. you know Arlene, but oh my, my mom is currently stalking you. Or the Please president help of Toyota. Help Thank you. you. Yes. Right? Oh, but my that's, God. But you know what? Those good Samaritans, when you find them, they just renew your faith in life and humanity. I, yeah. And I knew, we, I knew someone would eventually stop. And yeah. as Ruby said, we just had to look pathetic enough. <laughs> Good on you for looking pathetic. Way That's why go. I got out of the car, right? I'm like, if they see that there's a woman on the side of the road, they're going to yeah. help, right? We've got a woman, a children, a Vietnam vet. This is like a <laughs> Southern gentleman's dream to help out these people. Right. Oh, gosh. Wait till they find out we're Jewish and then they're going to be really praying for us at church. <laughs> exactly. So I went to something last night I haven't been to in a long time. What is that? A baby shower. Oh. (laughs) I was going to say a strip club. Yeah. I haven't been to one of those in a long time, too. But I haven't been to a baby shower. This is a friend of mine. And um, it it was just a small one. It was like we, uh, it's my workout group. And so we did that. And as we started talking, because we have all these generations of moms, like a few of us are all are empty nesters. A few of us have kids in like um, elementary and middle school. And then our friend who we were doing the shower for is about to be a first time mom, which is so exciting. And so we're talking about all of the different baby products, right? And how the evolution of baby products. And I left there with one like distinct um, idea really, which is, it's a miracle. My kids survived their childhood (laughs) because the fact we we did everything wrong. We didn't have baby seats when we were little. All right. Car seats and all that. We didn't have car seats. Those didn't exist. Seat belts were like revolutionary. Yeah. But I'm like, we're, we're laughing. I was talking to my friend Jennifer after, and she's like, oh yeah, because now they don't use blankets. They use these sleep sacks and there's no bumpers on the beds and they don't use this because they'll suffocate and they roll. I mean, everything is totally different. I'm like, it's amazing. Our kids actually survived. I mean, I think daddy had the two seater Alfa Romeo convertible with the luggage rack. (laughs) 
<laughs> as the back seat, and that's where we sat. We uh-huh. sat on a luggage rack. My butt was sitting on those bumps. It hurt, you know, and they I guess they thought the traction of the bumps that would keep the luggage from sliding would keep us from sliding. And it yep. was crazy because Daddy was super paranoid. He was paranoid before it was hip, right? I know. He, and, and, and the fact that he let us that. <laughs> you know we, why? Why? Because he was 40. And at 40 years old, honestly, he loved that car more than he loved us. <laughs> That's probably it. There were no smoking was, signs in the car, yeah. right? Yeah, he but. didn't like smoking and he was in favor of seatbelts, except he could make an exception if it was for that two-seater sports car. Which I don't blame him. That was a it was an awesome car. Yeah. And he was forty years old with a fifteen year old, a thirteen year old, and an eight year old. Yeah. I mean Oh, is that and, how old we were? Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty good. So So when you're talking about the baby shower, it reminded me of the story that I had a friend. She was like a new friend and I, like she was like a friend at first sight, you know, yeah. and I loved her and she ended up getting pregnant and she already had two other kids. So I was like, you should have a sprinkle. You, we should do a sprinkle for you. And she's like, what's a sprinkle? I go, well, it's when you've already had kids, right? You don't need a baby shower because you have all the stuff. It would just, we, it would just be super casual. We will go out to lunch with us and a few friends just to celebrate you. Hey, did you, you make know? up that name? A sprinkle? I uh, know I didn't. Oh, I love it. Isn't it cute? And it's just it's like, so cute. and it's I just love like, a sprinkle. Yeah. and people like want to give her stuff, just like little things though. Right. Yeah. So she's like, Oh my God, I love that idea. That is so sweet. Let me put you in touch with my best friend who turned it into a full-on baby shower. That defeats the purpose. Yes. And I was a new friend. So I went from being like, let's meet up for brunch one weekend with just a few girls to planning a freaking baby shower for someone I didn't know very well. (laughs) And that was not just like sending out invitations. It was organizing and paying for all the food luckily her friend hosted it yeah I it was so uncomfortable and I was like I think you've brought up a good point though I think there are people that no matter let's let's take baby shower aside but use that analogy that in life when it comes to celebrating milestones or momentous occasions there are like three categories some people like the shower right like the traditional sort of you know celebration some people like the sprinkle where it's just, it's a few close friends, it's it's nothing, not a big deal, but it's meaningful. Some people like the thunderstorm, right? Where it is all <laughs> out mayhem, where they yeah. have, you know, like the DJ and the Cirque du Soleil and stuff like that. And some people, you know, depending on the, ca- the occasion may like all three, but I think you have to know what somebody is into before you offer, because if you're offering the sprinkle, but they want the thunderstorm, but guess what? You're going to get the shower. That's the happy beat. Right? That is the in between. I think, I don't know if she wanted the shower or her friend wanted the shower. Yeah. Right. But once they, that became the involvement, I was like, I can't back out of this. I just have to grin and bear it. You know, it's a lot. The older was, I get, I just want the sprinkle. Anything in life. I just want a little sprinkle. Don't give me the shower. Surely do not give me the thunderstorm. It's yeah, too much. It's, it's too much. I'm I in my old age, I am also <laughs> more into the sprinkle, surprisingly. I don't like to do big celebrations. And we both have uh anniversaries coming up yes. in March. Mazel and tov. Mazel tov to you. My uh my marriage is now of drinking it will be of drinking age soon. So Fantastic. <laughs> and are, my marriage will we're celebrating be celebrating with a- tequila. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Uh, my marriage will actually be, Mark, the half um, of my life with the same person. So married wow. to the same person. I've been with him more than half of my life, but 26 years and I'm 52. So well, that's crazy. I think I'm at the point where I've been with Aaron longer than I haven't. So yeah. that's because we met when we were, we met in person when we were 22. <laughs> you have to stipulate <laughs> We met in person when we were 22. We started talking when we were 21, you know, and we, and I'm 45. Yeah. So that's kind of yeah. weird. Yeah. Also in Atlanta, I've been in Atlanta longer than I lived in Birmingham where we grew up. Same with you. How long have you been in Chattanooga for? 
uh, as long as I've been married. So 26 years, almost 26 years. So, and yeah. by the way, what's less than a sprinkle in this that analogy? It's humidity. It's humidity. <laughs> So Alan, Alan wants humidity. So he's going to be very upset that I even mentioned our anniversary. So it's sort of like the secondary equivalent of posting on Facebook. So let's pretend I never mentioned it because he likes, he, he likes below humidity. He likes like, I don't know what that is, a, a teaspoon of water. <laughs> Wait, that's unfair because it's both of your anniversaries. Why does he get to decide that? There's... Well, I get it because he just doesn't want me to broadcast anything about anything. Which is why I have this podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Don't tell them. (laughs) You're screwed. (laughs) Our poor husbands. Just don't tell them. (laughs) I think we, our first podcast was, uh, we started off with, uh, the the title was, uh, Our Husbands Are Our Best Audience. And I think to this day, they still. It's still true. True. And speaking of the first podcast. This is our 250th podcast. 250. Unbelievable. And although we might like sprinkles to celebrate our birthdays, I do think we should have a shower to celebrate our podcast in its sixth year, which is in May. So stay tuned. We might throw a party. We'll see if that happens. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for listening to the latest Sis and Tell podcast. Don't forget to share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your foes. As always, this has been Amanda and Allison with a whole lot of talk about a whole lot of nothing. We'll catch you next time.